Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to a brand new edition of Geek to Me Radio, episode 238. Today we're joined by Danny Hedlund, the CEO of Brink Literacy, talking about her new project, The Literary Tarot, and how you can get involved and back them on Kickstarter. We'll then talk to actor and writer Shannon Kenny Carbonell about her voiceover roles, her acting roles, and her brand new book. All that and more, stand by. We're talking to you. And for our longtime listeners, welcome back. We always appreciate having you here each week. For those new listeners who might be finding us for the very first time, welcome to geek to me Radio. I'm your host, James Enstall. Each week, we try to bring you new and exciting and interesting guests from the world of pop culture. And today, we've got two spectacular guests that I'm very excited for you to hear. Let's jump right in. Right now, we're talking with Danny Hedlund, the Brink Literacy CEO, and that's an organization, a uh, nonprofit dedicated to changing the world through storytelling with a brand new Kickstarter that I'm very excited to talk about. Danny, how are you? Oh, I'm lovely. Thanks so much for talking to me today. Glad to have you. Uh, it's so funny. I've always been fascinated with tarot cards. As a little boy, one of the first James Bond movies I saw was Live and Let Die, and they do the tarot cards in that, and I actually, in college bought that self-same tarot deck and I did this whole presentation. I dug into the lore. So the fact that you're now doing this with all these amazing writers and artists is just the the perfect storm for me. So talk a little bit about where the notion for the project came for you. Oh yeah, of course. Um, it seems like the origin of almost everything that happened in the last year has something to do with COVID. Right. So of course ours <laughs> was like, oh goodness, COVID started. And as a education nonprofit, Obviously, most of our money just immediately disappeared because foundations started giving money to medical, which makes perfect sense. And then the bookstores started to close and about 70 percent of our income just disappeared overnight. Mm. And so we were like, well, how are we going to survive this? And very serendipitously, sort of weird things started to come together um, in our nonprofit. We published our very first story about tarot in one of our friction issues. And it was by a debut writer, very first thing she ever published. And it was so good. I just really couldn't get past it, but I didn't know anything about tarot. So I started to dig into it a little bit and we had a friend run a really successful Kickstarter. And I was like, well, hell, like if we can't have big fancy galas to fund the nonprofit, maybe we could delve into this really new sort of space. But let me tell you, like you with James Bond, it was a learning curve. It was pretty yeah. much like getting a PhD in kicks in <laughs> uh, tarot in six months. Yeah, and it's it's such a fascinating all the the lore and everything behind it, and the uh, the the cultural significance of tarot uh, throughout the ages. So when you're doing this, obviously for those who are, may not be familiar, uh, tarot cards you've probably seen people. It's a very commercial thing. Some people will do it uh, in places like tourist destinations, like New Orleans, but it's rooted in that culture as well. And they'll, they can tell your future. They can do all sorts of things with them. And the more you dig into it, the more fascinating it becomes, but there, there is a major arcana and a minor arcana. The minor arcana of course is based on what we have or our current playing cards that we play pinochle and rummy and blackjack with and everything like that. Um, so talk a little bit about going, when you got into this, okay, you've got the major and the minor, you're going to pair this with certain people. How did the connections get made as far as, well, we're going to have, for example, Lev Grossman uh, do one of these and we're going to have, you know, uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick in on this. How did those pairings come about? Yeah, um, well, when we kind of got this wild idea, we were, of course, running with a skeleton crew because it was COVID. So we were like, OK, we need to make this as manageable as possible. So I got this great idea that I just get a big old spreadsheet out. 
and I get together with some of my editors. I buy them free beer and we just go through <laughs> and pair each thing. And I realized very quickly how naive that was. Um, and it's fun that you mentioned Love Grossman because he was a really big turning point for the project where we really wanted to use the legend of King Arthur. And I was really struggling with what text to pull from, like, you know, so we don't get our faces sued off. Everything is a public domain. Right. And there's so many different tellings of King Arthur. And I was like, OK, well, Lev's been working on a King Arthur book for the many years I've known him. I'm just going to call him up and ask. And so I'm talking to Lev and I'm listening to the depth of information and insights. And he's been pouring through this text for so long that I thought to myself, Danny, why the hell are you doing this pairing? Like, you're never going to know King Arthur the way Lev Grossman does. So we were like, OK, it's going to be way more work. But what if we got authors in that were going to do the actual pairing? So I sat down with Lev and I was like, OK, Lev, what do you like about King Arthur? And instead of saying what I thought he was going to say, which was things like, you know, he's just he's such a man's man and he runs this whole nation. <laughs> For Lev, he really loved the tragedy of it. Like King Arthur isn't a story of success. It's one of com complete dismantlement so he was like i think it's amazing that they strive for this ideal of camelot knowing it will end so when we look at tarot cards he really wanted us to focus on something that herald an ending of an era and he paired it with the world card which is this really great card that's all about striving for something great but knowing that everything is circular and everything will die and everything will rebirth so it was this really beautiful moment of us being like yeah like this is how we do this right so when we went to Margaret Atwood, like she loved Jane Eyre and she immediately, as apparently a huge tarot guru, was like, I know exactly like this should be the queen of cups. And here's the reason. And we renamed the minor suit. So it was the queen of light. And she loved that it could um, reflect the moment where Jane Eyre is putting up a fire in the house. And so it all was just this really beautiful sort of portal into talking to my literary heroes and then having them talk to me about what they cared most about and bringing those themes forward through the arcana, which was such a cool way to look at it. And like you mentioned, you've substituted. So where before it's uh, cups and swords and everything like that, you've made it literary. So it's ink, quills, light and parchment, which I think is brilliant too. a way to kind of you, you can see it in your mind, how they correspond to the actual minor arcana symbol so that that was a great thought oh thanks so much we agonized over that <clears throat> particularly quills and ink we just kept like going back and forth about which one should be wands and which one should be swords and we really in january made the decision we were like okay like we're definitely going to have swords be ink and then we started the art and then all of the tarot advisors are like no danny like swords are pointy like, I don't care about your logic. I need a pointy thing. And I was like, all right, I'll redo all this art. And again, the, the obviously the major arcana have symbols that have, depending on their, and again, this is getting into it far more than we probably need to, but if, the, if you see them in a, in a certain position, uh, when they're laid out in their proper form, they can take on different meanings. Uh, but I love like the fool is uh, based, uh, per, I should say paired with, Don Quixote is the literary piece and uh, Patrick Rothfuss worked on that. Did you let each person who came in kind of pick their major arcana and their literary piece or did you kind of have suggestions in place? It really depended on what the background of the author was. Um, so for Lev, who didn't know anything about tarot, he really was just like, here's what I care about. And then I had a team of tarot advisors, which were a bunch of awesome witchy people from around the globe on one very active Slack channel. So I would copy and paste and I'm like, here's what Lev cares about. And then these 10 people would just pounce on it and be like, what about this card? What about this card? And then we narrow down all the suggestions and write up our reasoning. And then the author would choose. But then there are some um, authors who started with the card. So Kelly Sue DeConnick was the first one who did it. And mm. Kelly Sue is just amazing. Brilliant. But I had no idea she was into tarot when I made the ask. And she was like, oh, Danny, like my husband and I do this constantly. I draw a card every morning. Like I really, I, I really connect with the King of Swords, which is the King of Quills for us. Like I want to do that pairing backwards. So that conversation wasn't with my tarot advisors. Kelly Sue and I were just like, okay, what possible like literary fellows could really embody the sort of themes of being both really logical and level-headed, but then also kind of 
being a bit more irrational when you lead with your heart. And she ended up pairing it with um, Marcus Aurelius's meditations. And as a big philosophy geek, I was super happy. <laughs> so there was a lot of backwards things. And Pat with the fool was one of the backwards things. Like when he reached out, he was like, I don't care. I just want the fool. Could I please have the fool? And I was like, well, luckily, Pat, I was just holding it in hope she would take it. <laughs> and then we just WhatsApp messaged each other for like a month, just popping out pairings. And finally, he had the really great master stroke of being like, no, I think it's Don Quixote. The fool traditionally has a depiction of obviously the fool, but then like this little like happy dog that follows him around. So we did the art to make Sancho look like the little happy dog. Aww. So it worked out really well. And like I said, some of the other ones I think are really great pairings. They're just brilliant. Uh, the Hermit, Major Arcana, paired with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, you've got the Hangman with T.S. Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. These are and then you go into the minor arcana too. And like we mentioned, Margaret Atwood, Vita Ayala, who we've had on the show before. She's brilliant. Uh, the King of Light uh, would be King of Cups with Homer's The Odyssey. Uh, it's just, it's amazing. And you still got a few more days. Like if you're listening right now and think, well, this sounds really cool. You can back this Kickstarter. Uh, just go to Kickstarter and search for that. You can look it up and back it still. I think it goes through, is it the end of this month is the last date? Yep, yep. It ends on the 30th. So you can look that up. And so and you've got some other people as of the time I spoke with uh, Hannah from Super Fan Promotions who are still yet to be announced, correct? Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of um, really big hitters we're kind of hiding in our sleeve because that's what the press people told me to do. And I trust them implicitly. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and so what? just talk a little bit about, obviously, we, we've delved into and I could sit here and talk to you for probably another hour about uh the, the role of tarot and things like that and all these amazing people you've got but the kickstarter itself that's i know we've talked to many people on the show about their kickstarter campaigns and it's a daunting process so what was the biggest part of the learning curve for you doing this kickstarter campaign we'll pause right there take our first commercial break come back and chat more with danny headland please stand by This is Diane Pershing, the voice of Poison Ivy, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. Welcome back to Geek to Me Radio. Before we took that last break, we were chatting with Danny Headland, the CEO of Brink Literacy, and we'd asked her, as far as this project, the Literary Tarot, what was the biggest hurdle navigating the Kickstarter campaign for it? Oh, goodness. Well... Uh, we've run Kickstarters in the past for our publishing unit for friction, okay. <clears throat> but people don't like a really successful book campaign, like maybe makes a hundred thousand dollars. But for us, usually if we make like 30,000, we bring in a thousand new readers. We feel really good about ourselves mm -hmm. because people just, you know, don't read very much, which is why we run a literacy <laughs> nonprofit. Um, so I, I was really not prepared for the sheer magnitude of this. Mm. Um, like we have really active backers. They really want to peer behind the curtains to figure out how that worked. And that's all been really great. Um, but for me, more than anything, this is the first campaign we had sort of the leverage to do press on. And I was really kind I just I didn't understand how much time that would take. Like I'm I'm the, the face woman for the nonprofit. So I do all the TV interviews and all the big journal reds, but it's it's for nonprofit stuff. Like I'm always talking about prison reform and like abysmal education rates. So this has been a really big change where I'm like, oh, I'm gonna spend all day like doing email interviews about how excited I am about tarot. So it was it was really interesting that so many people cared. And I guess I wasn't quite prepared for how many people would care about it. I'm sure it's a little more upbeat, too. It's like this is, a, you know, not not that what you're talking about otherwise is not, but it's just this is exciting. And it's kind of a, it's a different something for you to talk about, I guess. Yeah, it's it's an entirely different sort of um, position to be in. Usually before COVID, when we fundraise, like there'd be big fancy galas and I would bring one of my, you know, formerly incarcerated students onto the stage. And then we would all cry together while drunk. So this is like <laughs> very different. So this is more of a happy crying if there's going to be drinking involved then probably <laughs> rather yeah, than, a, rather honestly, than, oh, that's a sweet story. If Of all of the terror of COVID, like I'm really glad it made us rethink the way that we connect with the community because, as, I mean, as a creative, the idea that I can get really brilliant people together. And I really can't stress enough how incredible it is that 78 of some of the biggest storytellers in the world donated their time. Wow. They're not getting paid. 
They just sit down and talk to me about Huckleberry Finn for hours because they care and they care about the cause and they care about storytelling. And it's just it's really kind of given me faith in humanity. And the fact that this many people in the Kickstarter community have also either gotten into tarot because they thought this storytelling angle was cool or they were really excited or hell, maybe they don't care about tarot at all, but they want to give some money to the nonprofit. Yeah, it's been it's been a really great sort of reawakening of like, oh, humans are still really great. (laughs) And I know a lot of times when I have Kickstarters, I'm very proud of the fact that every time we have someone on for their Kickstarter, uh, they're they're trying to reach a certain goal and we've helped them. Every single person who's been on here for a Kickstarter to promote it, they've made their goal or surpassed it. I don't have that worry with you because you're already well past the goal, which is incredible. Congratulations on that, by the way. Oh, thank you so much. But I know uh, if you're wanting to back this, if you're listening right now, uh, you can certainly do that. And I want to uh, say once again, just go to Kickstarter, look for The Literary Tarot. Uh, I'm sorry, what am I saying? I'm reading it here, so I'm pronouncing it phonetically. <laughs> the Literary Tarot. And I, I got to give a shout out too, because you've got these artists who are working on this for you. And this would be obviously nothing without the artist doing all the work. Samantha Dow on The Major Arcana. And you've got, uh, I think for light, you have Shan Benny. And I'm, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing some of these. Uh, Quills is oh, Isabel no, Burke. Uh, Parchment is Bradley Clayton. And ink and box design are by Edge Ebony. To be honest, Edge has worked for me for five years. And I cannot figure out how to pronounce her name because we all just <laughs> see each other's names in writing. There you um, <clears throat> a special shout out to one of those. I mean, all of my artists are incredible and I love all of them. Um, Isabel Burke, who does the quill uh, suit, this is her first professional gig ever. Oh, wow. Like, I randomly found a piece of artwork on I, Tumblr on one of my other people. I was like, oh, I really like this. I'll reach out. I think she really compliments the other style. And when I met with her, I was like, oh, you can't legally drink in public and you've <laughs> never worked for money before. Wow. But she is just so it's this incredible diversity on the art team. They're all from really diverse backgrounds, really diverse, um, like industry standards. They've worked on different aspects and they're so loving to each other. They have their own little Slack channel and they just compliment each other in all caps. And it's just, it's really great. And I'm so proud to launch some new careers, but also to get people paid well it's very exciting that the kickstarter is doing so well so i can pay my artists legitimate money sure. instead of what i usually do so <laughs> yeah honestly it's it's been really great and the art team is just incredible and i'm so lucky to direct them and if you're listening to this if you're even half as excited as i am about this project uh like i said it is a non-for-profit you can go to the organization and donate directly but also this is a great way to help them out, to support these artists, and to just get something really, really cool. Because it's uh, this is unlike any project I've ever heard of, which probably excites me the most. The Brink Literacy Project. And again, the Kickstarter campaign. Just go for uh, the search and put in the Literary Tarot. And Danny Headland, anything else you want to mention? Or uh, uh, you know, make sure you give a shout out to anybody else? Um, I mean, honestly, I have to shout out my whole team because I couldn't have done this without them. It really takes a village. There's like 50 of us kind of toiling in the background and everyone's volunteer and it's so incredible. So I'm so incredibly grateful. Um, And I just want to say before I started this, I didn't know anything about tarot, but I was always really tarot curious. And for anyone who's kind of feeling that way, I think this is a really good kind of emergence. We can all kind of lean on the themes we understand in literature to get into this really cool new art form. So if you're a wee bit curious, I'd recommend trying it out. It's a really good immersion tool. And also, if you're a practicing Wiccan who feels like they should read more, this is also good for you. So <laughs> yeah, it's I like a so. built-in reading list. <laughs> exactly. It, it makes everyone happy. <laughs> Uh, This has been such a great time. Tell people where they can find more about you and Brink Literacy Mm -hmm. online, on social media, that kind of thing. Yeah, of course. Um, So online, you can see us at brinklit.org. Or if you're interested in the crazy publishing um, endeavor we do, which is why we know so many cool celebrities, that's frictionlit.org. Or you can find us online at Friction Series. And that is our handle for Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Absolutely brilliant. I love this idea. As soon as I hang up with you, I'm going to go back to Kickstarter because I, I, I've got to see how this turns out. Uh, Danny Headland, thanks so much for your time today. It's been great. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And you have an incredibly lovely day. My thanks again to Danny Headland. You can still back this project. We'll have a link in the show notes and tell you exactly how. It's a very cool project. I've already backed it, and I suggest you do too. If you can't back it or you're listening to this after the project has already ended, you can go to the website, which we'll also link in the show notes, and you can support Brink Literacy. 
We're going to take our next commercial break. We'll come right back chatting with Shannon Kenny Carbonell. Please stand by. Hi, this is Will Friedel. You might have heard my voice as lion from Thundercats, Ron Stoppable, or Batman Beyond. And you are listening to geek to me Radio. Welcome back to geek to me Radio. Want to make sure we tell you about our official movie sponsor, Marcus Theaters. MarcusTheaters.com is the website. You can find the Marcus Theaters or Movie Tavern closest to you. Buy your tickets right there online for the movie you want to see. And there are a lot of great movies that are out right now or coming out very soon. If you're a Marvel Comics fan like me, you're excited for Black Widow and Shang-Chi, both out very, very soon. And there's a lot of other movies that you'll want to get out and see whether or not you uh, want to take your kids to the movies or that you just want to get out and go to a movie theater for the first time because it may have been a while since you've been to the movie theater. Marcus Theaters makes it a safe and fun place to go back and see the movies. You can also download the Marcus Theaters app for your smartphone or device, and you can purchase your tickets and get concessions right there through the app so they're ready and waiting for you when you arrive. There's not a better place to see a movie then on Marcus Theaters, and trust me, I've been to a lot of different places to see movies. Marcus Theaters does it right, and they do it the best. MarcusTheaters.com, again, for that website for the best movie-going experience in the galaxy. Right now, we've got our second guest on deck. Here we go. We're talking live with Shannon Kenny Carbonell. Uh, many voice roles, many acting roles, and you've got a book out now. How are you? I'm very well. So lovely to see you. You too. Is this your first con coming back now that we're at the uh, kind of light at the end of the COVID tunnel? Yeah, it's my first con uh, definitely after COVID. And it's actually only my second con. I did one way back in San Diego when I was on The Invisible Man. And that's, that's a big con, San Diego. <laughs> it's a big one, and I've actually been to a few with my husband at in uh, for his various shows, but only Comic Con in San Diego. Your husband, you're married to somebody famous, right? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I forget what he's done. Yeah, yeah, but he's just uh, husband and dad to us, right. uh, Nestor Carvanel. Right. <laughs> yes. And so we would start talking before we did the interview here about Ink uh, yes. in Batman Beyond, which was an original villain created brand new for the series. So it's just a, a lot of fun, I would think, to play that role. And you said villains are the best to play. I love villains. I've played villains as a voiceover actress, but also as an actress actress. And the best way to play a villain is to never think you're doing anything wrong, uh, to always justify what you're doing, and to love it. <laughs> to just be a delicious B word. And... Uh, you just lap it up and, and, and everything you do is for the good. Everything is justified and, and it's fun to do it as the villain. That's, that's your motivation. And I loved her. And she had such great um, special powers. Yes. Yes. And it's, so how familiar, because it's obviously an extension of the Batman mythos, how familiar with you were you with Batman overall going into getting the part? Uh, uh, unfamiliar, completely. I'm a girl. <laughs> I wasn't a comic book fan other than the Archie comics yeah. growing up. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't really know much about it. And it's so ironic that Nestor ended up doing the Batman Dark Knight, movies, yeah. the Dark Knight. See, I wouldn't even know the franchise. Um, but I certainly became familiar doing the the um, the animated show. And uh, yeah, so that's as familiar as I got, but very familiar with her and her superpowers to slide under doors and become various forms yeah. of metal, I guess, right? Or lead yeah. or ink. Yeah, it was almost like a female clay face, which was a Batman shape-shifting villain yes. who could do stuff, but so much more insidious. Yes. Just a, a very rich demeanor. You're, the way you did your voice was very regal. That uh, what, what notions did you have going in for that character versus how you were directed once you were in studio? I think they directed me... I think it was an offer, but I'd done a lot with this particular production company, and I did a British accent, uh, and I had... I Maybe they had seen me play a few sort of uh, kind of evil roles on TV, <laughs> and I think they... They, they would give me directions on lines, but not really an overall direction for the character. Okay. I sort of had the character down as in 
just loving it and having fun because she could have, I remember she this was a long time ago don't forget I mean and it I've doesn't had, seem like it but yeah. <laughs> it was I have had two children since so my brain cells are a little mushy but I remember she could go under doorways and then she could become solid yeah yeah and then I could like like you know zonk people out I could beat people up so I just think it was so much fun she, she enjoyed every form that she could be in and I think I even sort of changed her nuances by every form like when she was liquid I could be very liquid and then when she was solid I could be solid like a solid evil person kind of the voice and mimics the form almost I had I remember I mimicked the voice to the form yes exactly and and I loved doing those shows because we sat in a circle and this is the way they always did it with mm -hmm. this franchise and everything this production company did you sat in a circle like you were doing a play yeah. And then you got to sit with amazing actors, to sit across from them that I wouldn't have otherwise worked with. Uh, I, I remember Bill Macy. Um, That's right. Uh, 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 the guy who played, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, Kevin. Kevin Conroy. Conroy. Yeah. Um, I, and I made a really good friend from doing that, Lauren Tom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. our friends today. Oh, nice. Yes. And, uh, oh, uh many others and doing the other ones too like Max Steele and stuff like that and uh, oh I did uh, Calamity Jane they did the same thing we all sat in a circle and I did that with Jennifer Jason Lee. oh nice he's one of my favorite actresses and yes. doing voice work versus doing a live action like Invisible Man do you have when you look back do you have a preference do you like the live action more is the voice more fun uh, a little more playful do you have a preference as an actor I think I definitely prefer doing you know, live action, being in the in the scene with the people, but there was such a convenience to doing animated stuff because you didn't have to dress up. You right. could roll in your in your pajamas. <laughs> it was very COVID friendly. Right. <laughs> All and, the days back then. <laughs> yeah, and you would, do, and I did love that sitting around like a table read, and uh, and there was a lovely camaraderie doing that, and I'd always seemed to be very nice to people, and it really seemed to be actors, actors. Yes. Yes. That was the, a big thing about voiceovers. Yeah, Andrea Romano, who did a lot of the casting, she specifically looked for people yes. who wanted, you know, the, the, people were approaching her yes. after the success of the first Batman. So, like you said, the caliber of people you had on the show with you, yes. um, just phenomenal and doing almost like a radio play. We'll pause right there, take our next break, come back and chat more with Shannon Kenny Carbonell. Please stand by. This is Andrea Romano. I happen to be the voice director for many animated series, including The Justice League. You are listening on geek to me Radio. Welcome back to geek to me Radio. Chatting with Shannon Kenny Carbonell, and we'd asked her about her voice role, obviously, in Batman Beyond, and we couldn't help but ask about working under the direction of Andrea Romano. Yes, I owe a lot of my voice... Uh, acting work to her because she would ask once she you were in with her she would ask you back and back and back to do a lot of stuff and uh, I yes she I had a great rapport with her I, I loved her and she directed most of them yeah. yeah yeah we've had Andrea on the show I think three times and I've literally I'm waiting for someone to go she was awful to work with no one else oh. everyone everyone just gushes about Andrea. But I want to know how she is she's good she's re good. she's retired from directing yeah but. Uh, She's, she said the right project might lure her back. So I don't know if they'll do a Batman Beyond reunion maybe coming down the pike. Who knows? Oh, if there so. is, yeah. And if you ever talk to her, please give her my love. Off, off mic. <laughs> oh, I, I absolutely will. <laughs> yes, I adore her. And you've got a book out, All Is I Not do. Lost. What was the genesis of the idea for the book? It's a personal journey, and it's about the moment I quit acting, actually, to become a full-time mom. And almost immediately, I had a big battle with my own ego and ambition that was all caught up in my career, yeah. being an actor. And uh, But I was very drawn to raise my children. And uh, so I made the decision to be a stay-at-home mom, knowing how lucky I was, yeah. and knowing that's a very rare decision to be able to make these days, and a privileged decision. 
But as soon as I made it, I, a huge cavern opened up inside of me. And I didn't realize how much of my identity was very tied up in my career and of being an actress. Yeah. Um, and I, w- beca- I was in a big battle with myself and a huge guilt battle because of knowing how lucky I was to even have kids. You know, I had a girlfriend who was going through IVF at the time, and, and here I was sitting in this very privileged position, being able to raise my boys, but sitting very uncomfortably in it. And I had to, I had a lot of sort of lost years before we actually moved to Hawaii for a full year when my husband was doing the last season of Lost. And I moved there very unsteady, and, uh, and, Something about moving to that island, and I think it was very in a very lost way. I changing the longitude and latitude of my, of, of, of sort of the pinpoints of, of of just where we lived, and and looking back on Hollywood. Yeah, it was a very healing process, having to do with the land, having to do with the show itself. It's not a tell-all, right. but there's a lot of parallels to the show. <laughs> Because it, I was telling him, it's, it's the truth. It was really that was the backdrop of our lives yeah. at that time, and I kind of took this really healing journey, sort of almost unknowingly. And it's very funny. The book is funny and sad, um, but it's a journey sort of that I took back home to myself without any label of being an actor or a career person, and sort of just finding sort of. My true, my true self, yeah. and it was an amazing year, and I chronicle it, and uh, and it's really resonating with a lot of people, especially so, with now people are the stigma of, of uh, mental health is kind of lifting. People are able to share more, so I think it's it's timely that it's out. People can yes, look at it is, and a lot of women are writing to me just saying I felt that too, and a lot of women are too scared to say it because first of all, you don't want to say. You know, these kids are a blessing and you love them, of course, but nobody wants to say, but I'm feeling kind of crappy yeah, about this. Of course. And the other privilege of being a stay at home mom, people are guilty and saying, I have this, I mean, this is a great choice I was able to make, but why do I feel like crap? Yeah. Um, so it's like people are saying, finally, somebody's saying this. I felt the same way. I just didn't voice it. And I am getting a lot of letters, a ton of letters and, and Instagram messages and, and, and letters on my website about, thank you, I feel heard. I feel like you're speaking to me. Yeah. And it's okay to feel both feelings. And, and as, as grateful as we are for our children, and, and you can't lose all of yourself. Yeah. You have to keep some things alive, and that's what I learned in this this journey in this book. And uh, it's a fun it's a fun read. So obviously, you you very well adjusted. You got through it. Was the book cathartic? Was it was it part of that journey, helping you reach that other side? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. It's it's that was key. Yeah. And finding um, the outlet of writing, which sort of came naturally to me, being an actor, I, I'd written most of my backstory for every character. <laughs> And uh, and letting that sort of in as well was very cathartic and uh, very useful. Yeah, I don't want to spoil the whole book. <laughs> right? No. Yeah, <laughs> we need to go out and buy it. I mean, I'm assuming. Obviously, we always recommend that people go to their local bookstore and support small business. But obviously, they can get on Amazon, wherever books are sold, and things like that. Exactly. Wherever books are sold, your your local bookstore, Barnes and Noble as well, uh, Books a Million, and Indiebound. Perfect. And one last question before I let you go. Um, what do your children think of mommy and daddy being in this show and that show and you doing voices on Batman and stuff? What, what do your kids think? Utterly unimpressed. Really? Completely. <laughs> Nestor tells the greatest story when he, he got uh, The Dark Knight and uh, he was telling our oldest son, he was little then, uh, oh, guess what? Daddy got a job on, on The Dark Knight, uh, on Batman, on the Batman movie. And, and <laughs> Rafa said, oh, what role are you playing? And he said, I'm going to play the mayor. I'm going to play the mayor of Gotham. And, and Robert said, oh, that's great. But when are you going to play Batman? <laughs> <laughs> and he's so like, close with Batman. You're all on I the know, tech. So close. <laughs> I know. So they, and even my, my older one started watching Lost and was hooked. Absolutely loved it, binging it up until Nestor's character came on and then turned it off. <laughs> it's like they can't, they can't. They can't suspend their disbelief when it comes to dad being on screen or mom. I guess that makes but, sense to a degree. You're yes. your mom and dad to them, you know. Yeah, it's very hard. Yeah. I even find it hard sometimes right. to cross over. 
uh, when Nestor comes on screen. It's like, <laughs> ah, you wrecked it for me. Thanks, you ruined the whole show. That's <laughs> yeah, great. exactly. Except for Lost, I was a huge Lost fan before he was on it. Yeah, that brought a lot of people in. I mean, that's mm. one of those, uh, people are always, have you seen Lost? So, yeah. Yeah, I was a big Losty. And before I let you go, uh, obviously we talked about the book. Website, uh, social media, where can people keep up with you? Yes, I have a website, shannonkennycarbonell.com. My Instagram handle is new Shannon J K C. Okay. And uh, that's it. Okay. I'm trying to think. I'm not on Twitter. Yeah. All right. We'll put links to all those in the show notes. If you're listening, go to the show notes and we'll have links to that. You can get the book and everything right from there. Shannon, thank you so much for your time today. It was such a pleasure and such a great surprise. Thank you. I love talking with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> My thanks once again to Shannon Kenny Carbonell. We'll put a link to her book in the show notes. Uh, it'll lead to our Amazon affiliate page. If you do want to click that link, not only will Shannon be happy that you're buying a book from her, but also we'll get a small percentage of the proceeds of that sale. It's no extra cost to you. It takes nothing away from Shannon's proceeds. It just kind of is a way for you to support the show by shopping through our Amazon affiliate link. We're going to take our next commercial break, our last commercial break of the show, come back to a little bit of housekeeping, so please stand by. Hi, this is Dean Devlin, director of Bad Samaritan, and you are listening to Geek to Me Radio. And we're back for the final segment here on Geek to Me Radio. Uh, people have been asking lately how they can support the show. A lot of different ways you can support the show. Just following us on Twitter and Instagram at Geek to Me Radio. Uh, the Facebook.com, if you like the page there, Facebook.com slash Geek to Me Radio. Liking the page also always helps. The YouTube channel, we'd like to get those numbers up. So if you go to YouTube, find Geek to Me Radio. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel, first of all. That's the main thing. Also, click the little bell icon so you always get notifications every time a new show is posted. These shows that you're hearing right now are strictly online. We also do a live show on Sunday nights on the Big 550 KTRS, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. You can listen to those. We just had a great chat with the incomparable artist Rick Burchett and, of course, the legendary Dan Slott talking about their run on She-Hulk and just about their careers in comics in general. We always have a great show every Sunday night and then these online shows as well. So the more you're following us, the more content of ours you're getting. Check out our website. Play around on geek2meradio.com. That website was just overhauled right when we launched this show on our new station, the Big 550 KTRS in St. Louis. So go to the website, click around there, play around, have some fun, uh, bookmark it, and that always helps us too. It raises our visual in the search optimization. I can't even say it right. Search engine optimization. So just playing around the website will help. The Amazon affiliate, we mentioned it right at the end of the last segment talking about Shannon Kenny Carbonell's book. But if you go to bit.ly slash geek to me, Go to the Amazon affiliate link, and if you shop on Amazon, you normally do a little bit of that sale you make. You won't notice it. The people who you're buying from won't notice it, but Amazon notices it, and they give us a little, small, tiny fraction of that sale. That does help us to support the show. Uh, Joey, I'd love to start paying him something more than I do now. He does everything he does for me just out of the kindness of his heart, and I'd love to start giving him some money because he makes the show sound as good as it does, uh, and he works twice as hard on it as I do, honestly. So I'd love to start paying him. Be sure to listen to the show on Sundays. Tell your friends about it. The more people we have listening, uh, the greater that helps us out again. Those are just some simple ways you can support Geeks Me Radio, and we do appreciate all of you who listen each week and who do support the show. That's going to wrap it up. My thanks again to Danny Hedlund. Make sure you check out the Kickstarter page for the Literary Tarot, and if you've already passed the date, if you're hearing this after the fact... Uh, then make sure you check out Brink Literacy and support that worthwhile cause. Thanks to Shannon Kenny Carbonell, a brilliant lady. It was so great to talk to her and just listen to her story about how she's gone from acting into motherhood and how this book came about. And we always want to make sure you support people like that and make sure you pick up her book as well. That's going to do it for us. Until next week, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I sound.
Thank you, future Gotham City. Good night. Hey, kids. Are your parents about to buy you a shiny new toy from Amazon? Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? (laughs) Well, don't be selfish. Share some of that money with us. Before going on Amazon, make sure to type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. It will look just like Amazon.com, except it'll say referral geek to me radio up top. And then when you check out, a tiny percentage will go to support the show without costing you one cent more. So before your parents get you that gizmo, gadget, or widget, make sure they type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. Bit.ly slash geek to me. Bit.ly slash geek to me.